is Julie Ann Link, and welcome to the Music Link. This week on the Let's Link project, I'd like to welcome the Assistant Professor of Bassoon and Academic Studies at the Middle Tennessee State University, Dr. Lee Munoz. Thank you so much for being here, Lee. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Lee, please share an overview of who you are and what you do as a professional musician. Okay, so I do a lot of different things. As you, you know that I got the job for Middle Tennessee State University. This is my first year, so I started a job in the middle of a pandemic, which was interesting. It's also my first tenure track position, so I've really in, enjoyed, uh, you know, meeting new people and, you know, it's really been fun. I also own uh, Go Bassoon Reads. A lot of people know me. I've got, come to terms with it. I'm the Go Bassoon Lady. <laughs> They find out, oh, you're the go bassoon lady. And I'm like, that's me. <laughs> um, I've owned that for just over 10 years, and I make every, the, all the reads myself. I also play second bassoon with Symphony of Northwest Arkansas. Uh, and I really, that's like, it's going to a group that I like to play with friends. You know, like that's what ma really makes making music with friends is wonderful. Um, and a couple other things that I do <laughs> in addition to that is, uh, we just finished uh, Meg Quigley and uh, Meg Quigley Vivaldi uh, virtual symposium and competition. And I do the, I'm the co-vendor along with Shannon Lau. Uh, we co-vendor coordinators for that. And I also am the editor for the online Contra Bassoon Fingerings and International Double Read site, uh, Society website. So a little bit of everything in other words. <laughs> yes, Lee, wow. Could you tell us where you grew up? Uh, I grew up in Reston, Virginia for most of my, the longest I lived anywhere was Reston, mm -hmm. Virginia. Um, and, but I also spent a lot of summers in uh, uh, Northeast, the Northeast in Rhode Island because both of my uh, parents' families are from there, and I'd spend a lot of free time on the beaches in Narragansett Bay and things like that, and just, you know, enjoying uh, Rhode Island uh, and everything like that. So I, I'm definitely from Reston, Virginia, and it's a neat little community that back then was still a very small town at the time. It wasn't it was considered a very far away suburb of DC, but it's really not anymore. It's actually one of the major sub uh, suburbs of DC. It was a planned community and it was really interesting because they actually planned from the very beginning when it was started to have like wildlife areas and paths and pools like planned out throughout the city. They also wanted to mix uh, different uh, priced housing within each other, you know, so that they weren't, it wasn't just like a city divided by uh, different incomes and things like that. So it was a really interesting place to be um, and uh, a neat place to grow up. I, I met a lot of people uh, that way. So it was really cool. Yeah, Lee, did you spend a lot of time outside and outdoors? Growing. Yeah, I was a horseback rider, so wow. I, give me a dirty barn and horses, and I was at home there. <laughs> um, I did spend a lot of time outdoors. My mom really encouraged me to do it. Uh, our house kind of backed onto a creek, so there was actually woods in our backyard. Even though our yard wasn't huge, uh, it was still, it felt like really like it was attached to nature, which was neat. So really lucky growing up, yeah. Beautiful. How did you first get introduced to music and playing the bassoon? Uh, well, music in particular, I was, I, I can't remember when I first heard my dad sing, but my dad sang and played the guitar for me a lot uh, when I was young. Um, both of my parents call themselves music appreciators. I think they're more than that. <laughs> um, but uh, my dad uh, played guitar extraordinarily well. And he would play, you know, like Simon and Garfunkel or uh, folk tunes, uh, Peter, Paul, and Mary. He was a really big fan of Peter, Paul, and Mary. Um, matter of fact, the wedding song, if you know, was from Peter, Paul, and Mary. He wrote it and my dad actually played it at our wedding because it was always a dream of mine when I was a kid that he would come and play at my wedding and uh, still tear up about it now. It was so special to me. So I was always kind of exposed to music as a kid. I was really lucky. You know, he would just get very intimate, sit down. He would also read to us as well. My mom and, and dad would both encourage us in the arts, at me and my brother. Uh, and so I was really lucky. I remember starting piano like 
in second grade because all the neighborhood kids were doing it, right? And if the other neighborhood kids are doing it, you want to do it. And I had the most fantastic first piano teacher. She was just amazing. She taught me, you know, like even in second grade, I still remember learning the circle of fifths, rhythmical things, uh, theory, like chords, like, I, you know, like I had that basis before I even saw it in the school system. And that was incredible. Um, and she only taught me for a couple of years because her husband was in the Navy and then she moved on, but she was, she really, you know, really started my love for piano. Uh, and then I, I also, uh, went into flute later and then bassoon after that. So I, I got into flute <laughs> and then bassoon, just sort of, sort of, and then found my niche with bassoon after that. Mm. Lee, did you always know that you wanted to pursue music as a career? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I was very scared about it. I've always had feelings of insecurity that I would never be good enough, uh, especially since I, I, you know, I was, uh, well aware, or I thought I at least was well aware of how difficult, you know, the life of a musician is and how difficult it is to get a job. Um, and I was scared to do it. Um, I was often encouraged to become a teacher because I like to teach and I also did that. But there was something stubborn in me that just wanted to see if I could actually make it as a bassoonist. Like I wanted to be a bassoonist. Like I said, this is really it was more of a, for me, it, it felt like I was kind of pushing back against all the people saying, this is what you should be. And I'm like, no, I want to be a bassoonist. Uh, matter of fact, you know, I had a lot of people say, no, don't become a musician. <laughs> and I go, well, why not? You know, I was just that stubborn teenager in me. I think that really helped me get over the the fear and, and, and pursue music. Hmm. Where did you go to college and what was the music program like for you? So I went to a lot of different schools over many, many years. Um, I did my undergraduate work at Oberlin um, and I was really lucky there. It was really cool time for new music. Like Pauline Oliveros taught there, <laughs> like John Luther Adams taught there. And all the students there were incredible. There's like incredible new music. Like I had never heard new mu like music that had just been written. I hadn't really been exposed to that at that point. And, you know, like the coolest song to me was Tchaikovsky before that. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with Tchaikovsky. I love Tchaikovsky. But to hear all these new sounds and music that was just being born right in front of me, it was, I was so lucky. <laughs> like, and, and it was just amazing. Like Pauline Oliveras was so influential. Um, even the little time I got to personally spend with her, just listening to her deep listening band and seeing them work and the seriousness they took with making sounds and 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 music that was it was just incredible so i was really lucky i also got to play a lot of new music because the students there had to uh write cert for you know certain things in their freshman and sophomore year and one of them was uh, woodwind quartets and so a lot of my friends ended up being composers composition students and i would play a lot of them and it was just so fantastic it was also the time at oberlin that when i was there eighth blackbird was being born uh almost all the founders of ice like claire chase was in my class and you know like it, it was just it was amazing. Like uh, Becca Heller, who Rebecca Heller, she's now in charge of ice. She was uh, right a little younger than me, but you know, like it's incredible. Like that was what was going on at Oberlin, and it was so. It, it really influenced my life a lot. Um, after that, I went and got my master's at Ohio University, and it actually came in a part of time where I needed to build some confidence as a player, and it was this wonderful small music school in a big university, but, you know, stuck in, the, you know, kind of the middle of nowhere, Ohio. There's not a lot, you know, around the closest city is like two, two, two hours away. <laughs> and, um, but it was nice because I literally could sit in a practice room and just practice all day. And I remember doing that. I put so many hours on bassoon because that's what I needed. I needed to really buckle down and and do that. And I just remember that. I met Eric Stomberg. He was teaching there. He was the one who uh, who asked me if I would like to apply there. And I was so lucky to meet him. He really, you know, taught me a lot. And uh, then from there, I went to Boston at New England Conservatory to just do a performance certificate. I wasn't sure if I wanted to get a doctorate. I was like, school's hard. <laughs> 
just wanted to play, you know, like that's really what I wanted to do. I wanted to be in a big city. I had, I was familiar with the Northeast and I was relatively familiar with Richard Svoboda, though I hadn't really worked with him much before I got in there. And I studied with him for two years and just amazing. I got to gig. That's where I was able to have enough gigs to buy a Contra and things like that. Like, so that was really neat being in the middle of a big city. And I will say the string students, there are some of the best students. They're so incredible. The orchestras were amazing. Like it was no matter what orchestra you played in there, it was just an incredible experience. Um, and then finally I went to KU to get my doctorate. Um, I moved out to Kansas and it was great because I mean the, the thing I remember most about KU is I moved to Lawrence, Kansas and that's where I met my husband. So like I have a lot of fond memories for there and KU was just such a supportive community. The faculty are stellar and like it was just a great community for me. Um, and you know I, I spent a lot of time there in Lawrence so I have a very special connection with it. Could you share more about when you were introduced to the contrabassoon? <laughs> yeah, sure. Oh, so I, you know, I remember I said I was a stubborn teenager. <laughs> I actually studied bassoon. My first bassoon teacher was Nancy Stutzman, who was the contrabassoonist in the Kennedy Center Opera Company for many, many, many years and was at that time. And I was like, no, I'm not playing contra. <laughs> Because, you know, she did, you know, it was just me just being backwards as a teenager. And I was determined, but, you know, I was told to get a contrary. So she gave me a fantastic contrary, by the way, um, that she had made to take to Oberlin. And, uh, you know, I got to Oberlin, I'm like, no, I'm a bassoonist. I'm not a contra bassoonist. Don't put me on that, you know. <laughs> but uh, it was really interesting. One of the first concerts and was, I was just telling somebody this at May Quigley the other day. This is really funny. Uh, I, that was John Clapp and he was a senior at Oberlin when I was there and he spent many years as the contrabassoonist in Grand Rapids Symphony uh, and he but, but back then he we we had to do Ravel piano concerto for the left hand and I was on second bassoon and he was on contrabassoon and I remember this because it was for one it was a phenomenal experience to play that piece but to hear contrabassoon as a melodic instrument was not something I had ever really considered. I, I didn't know, I was very ignorant about the instrument. I was just stubborn because I didn't want to play it. So I didn't want to learn anything about it. And I remember hearing him play that and I was like, okay, <laughs> this is this is something that's inspiring me a lot. I have to look into it. And then uh, George Sakakini, my teacher there, actually put me on, asked me to play contrabassoon for Bassoon Christmas. And that was all over after that because that was like the most fun ever because the contra always has these crazy solos in the middle of this Christmas bassoon ensemble music and I was like this is this is unique I like this and so I started working on it because I was like I'm not very good <laughs> and <laughs> I'm not sure about it and I, I played a lot uh, at Oberlin I matter of fact I think my first first bassoon part at Oberlin was my senior year so I, <laughs> I didn't play a lot of first bassoon I really wanted to play contra because I thought that was fun um, I took some time off of it and then it wasn't until I got to Boston that I had a lot of gigs. There's a lot of, you know, gigs at universities or smaller orchestras there that, you know, were one-offs or, you know, even like one or twice a year. And everybody wanted to play Mahler five the years I was there. <laughs> I played it like four times in two years. Um, but, you know, like I... I had a lot of gigs lined up and I didn't have a Contra, right? <laughs> and uh, I, the school didn't want to obviously loan the Contra out for that many, you know, like I probably uh, snuck it out of the building, but I didn't want to do that. I really didn't <laughs> want it to be legitimate with what I was doing. And, um, you know, so I looked it up and I could rent a Contra or I could get a loan for a Contra at the time and pay it off on the, a monthly. And it was still high risk because, you know, six months is a long time, but that's not the longest time in the world to know that you have income from this instrument. So I took a risk and I found a good deal on a new Fox Contra bassoon at the time. And I was able to, you know, pay that off with my freelancing in, in Boston, I was really lucky. So that's kind of how I got into it. Uh, you know, like both the very beginning and also how I became uh, more of a professional Contra bassoonist. Mm. Lee, could you share a bit more about your teachers and how they influenced your teaching now? 
oh, this is something that's near and dear to me. I actually very, very strongly that my students should know about the family tree. They're teaching family tree. We always talk about it once a year in my studio. Mm -hmm. And I really feel strongly because there's so many things that that our family of teachers have given us. And I feel very fortunate for it. So uh, George Sock, I'll start with George Sakakini. He, he in, uh, I still make a read with the same instructions he gave me on like one page typed. <laughs> he has this wonderful ebook out now, by the way, you should go get it. But I had one page typed like with a typewriter, no pictures or anything on how to form a read. And that's how I do it still to this day. Um, that's the, the go bassoon method, if you will, is really what he taught me. Um, and it just so happened to work really well for me. Um, I, I, I remember reads are always hard, but I don't remember them being excruciating, right? I never, I never had that experience that I know many have. So I was really lucky. Um, and the way he talked about reads. And then they're also, this is, uh, you know, we teach uh, Milda concert studies and Milda scale studies all the time. And I played so many of those with him. Um, and his conceptualization of musical phrase and how you know music mel melodic lines should be phrased and played I use those things every day in <laughs> like every single day I teach <laughs> I, I say something I'm like oh Mr. Sakakini thank you <laughs> you know so I have a lot of that uh from Mr. Sakakini also the he's got a beautiful sound I mean he's one of the sweetest sounds um you know that I really love uh his playing so that's something that's really special to me too um and then um Richard Svoboda uh, in Boston. I like to talk about him as a phrasician. I was mentioning this the other day to someone. Um, he, I, you know, just hearing him play, I learned more about how to, that the, the, the things you can do. He never stopped pushing me to try something more with the phrase, something different, something more. Uh, and, you know, like sometimes it would be go, no, that's not it. That would be his response, which is sometimes like, ah, what is it then? <laughs> you know. But once I realized what I had to do to make musical line, I had to rethink my long tones, my scales, my reeds, <laughs> like everything, my intonation, everything, so that I my fingerings changed everything to order to make the phrases that he was asking me to do. Um, I still remember going to see him play in the Boston Symphony, and he would play pieces that I've heard a thousand times before and I would hear him play like I've never heard before like like and mind-blowingly good like just like that's so he never like I really got from him never to stop pursuing a better way of making a phrase or even a different even if it's not better try something different there's no one way of doing it and keep pushing yourself to to try and make a different phrase out of what you're doing um Eric Stomberg I owe so much to <laughs> Um, I had a lot of confidence issues in my career. I talked about that a little as a teenager, but also after Oberlin, I was not sure I was cut, cut out to do it. Um, and I wasn't good enough at the time to actually believe in myself. And when Eric Stomberg met me, he probably met me at the lowest point of that, like where I was absolutely feeling terrible. I wasn't sure I wanted to play bassoon anymore. Um, and he, uh, I had really mostly stopped practicing after Oberlin. I worked at Interlock and Arts Academy. It was uh, as a hall counselor, as a full-time job and also worked the summer camp in the summer. But I, I honestly, I didn't get a lot done that year. <laughs> I was just soured on bassoon. I kind of just, you know, didn't do it, but he met me at a point where I was like, I, I can't decide if I want to keep going or not. And he just showed me, this is, this is something I'm, I mean, he showed me so many things, but this is the biggest gift he gave me. He showed me that my insecurities came from things that I couldn't do. And that wasn't that I couldn't do them forever, it's that I couldn't do them now. And here's a checklist of all the things that, I mean, he didn't write a checklist down, but this is the myth, method that he used. Here's the thing that you're feeling most insecure about. Let's fix that. And here's 10 ways to fix that. Here is 10, if you don't understand those 10 ways, here's 10 more ways to fix that. And we, and he just made it seem possible. Mm -hmm. We're in a moment where I felt that it was impossible <laughs> and I wasn't sure it was. And I, I got about that from him both in my master's 
as well as my doctor, as well as still today. <laughs> like I owe so much to the man. He's incredible. So that's that's what I guess I, I could go on about all of them. But if I wanted to pick one thing, I also had several like outside people that I never officially like studied with. Mm -hmm. But I remember my first contra bassoon lesson, I was, I had been playing contra for about 10 years. This is how it all works. We all figure out contra on our own. And then we're like, well, how are you really supposed to play it? <laughs> I figured out how I like to play it, but is that the right way? I don't know. You know, it's kind of the great experiment. <laughs> and so I remember Hank Skolnick, Henry Skolnick, who is now the librarian at St. Louis uh, Symphony. He's one of the librarians there. He um, he just as a favor to Eric Stomberg, I think, put me up in his house a couple days and just talked to me about Contra. He heard me play for hours. He made me the best espresso in the world. <laughs> but but it was the first time I've ever really talked to a Contra player about Contra bassoon. I had no idea, you know, like it was really cool. All these things you're figuring out on your own in the practice. And then he was able to fill in the holes of what I couldn't figure out for myself. And that was really, really special. <laughs> so that's another person. And I also had a one summer with, uh, that was really influential with Ben Kamen's at a small uh, summer festival that I don't think even exists anymore, but it was in Muncie, Indiana. And, um, it was great. It was great because I, I got to just talk to him a lot or listen, not even talk to him, listen to him talk about reads, about life, <laughs> about bassoon. And I learned a lot from him that summer as well. So there was, you know, a lot of different influences from different teachers there. Mm -hmm. Lee, do any specific courses or needed experiences come to mind that you wish universities had provided the opportunity to learn about while you were in school? Yeah, this is something that's a real big passion of mine. I taught uh, entrepreneurship at my previous job at the University of Missouri, and I really believe that we need to prepare our students and in a way that I don't think I was prepared. I'm not saying I was unprepared. <laughs> unprepared. <laughs> I just I just said there was a lot of things I had to learn as I went, right? <laughs> and it's all about the business of music and it's a business. And a lot of us, we have our dream jobs and we should have our dream jobs. I really feel that strongly that we should have our you know, long-term goal that so, seems so out of reach, but we still want to strive for it. And we should have that. But getting there, the path to getting there is not very clear these days. It's not that you usually, I mean, there are people that get out of school and get a job, but there's other people that can take 10 or 15 years. And how do you get there with, for first, not being soured on the experience, because it's a lot of what you may not like, right? <laughs> of things that you're doing along with the thing that you love. And how to do that and how to take a multiple streams of income from various different jobs while still aiming, ever seeing that goal and moving towards it. Um, I think that's a realistic thing that everybody faces at some point in their musical careers. And that's something that I feel is really important should be taught in schools. Um, mm -hmm. Some are teaching it now, which is great. It's it's definitely a different world from when I graduated my undergraduate degree. Um, it, for instance, I was teaching it myself. There's a whole program at the University of Missouri. And we have it here with a music industry uh, degree, a per music performance degree, uh, music industry Bachelor of Music here at Middle Tennessee State, which is just great. It exposes you to all the things that music, the business of music really encompasses. Mm. Could you tell us more about your teaching career? Okay, so teaching career. So I was the usual, like had one student or two students, unless you live in Texas, Texas is different. You have lots <laughs> of students, but you know, as I, in my different degrees, wherever I was, I was always teaching, you know, just one or two students. Some were adults, some were kids. Uh, I did a, I had an outreach fellowship at the New England Conservatory. So I worked with, and our, our group specialized in like small kids. So we went to like a lot of kindergartners, K through third grade. Uh, and that was fun. Uh, but the, but teaching, I really started getting serious when I was in Lawrence. Um, and I had, like I said, I mentioned before, I met the, uh, the man I was going to marry and, uh, and he had a young son. So we were going to stay in Lawrence. And so I had to figure out how to live in Lawrence and have income as a bassoonist. It was like what I was talking about with these multiple streams 
and still work towards my dreams until his son was old enough that we could start moving uh, for my career. And uh, so I taught a lot of private lessons. I would drive to Kansas City. I would drive to Topeka, which is about, you know, 30, 45 minutes away, their direction. And I taught a lot of private students that way. I also became an adjunct professor at some point uh, uh, at Washburn University and then also at Missouri State University, which was like five hours the other direction. <laughs> so I did a lot of driving <laughs> in my teaching, but it was really interesting because it gave me a lot of foundation foundations in my career so that when I was ready and when, you know, my personal life, we were ready to, to make a move that I was, you know, moving towards a full-time teaching job when I got it at the University of Missouri. So it was really interesting. So that's sort of how I did it is I just did a lot of teaching, a little bit, a little bit of teaching everywhere <laughs> for a very long time. It was about six years I did that. <laughs> and that was really fun. It was great. It was a good experience. Um, and uh, it was, but it was, it was an education because I could really figure out what my philosophical ideas as a teacher were separate from those of my own teachers. What my beliefs are, because all of my teachers are great, I, I respect them, but there comes a time where in every teacher's life where you go, what do I actually believe? What do I believe? What holds true for me? What works best for me? And that's where we come up with our own, you know, way of teaching. And that was a great moment for me to really figure it out. And I called my earliest students my lab rats. <laughs> They're still out there somewhere. Uh, one lives in Nashville, actually. It's really cool. I just moved closer to her. So we, we met up for some social distance coffee this last summer. But it's really neat. I call them my lab rats because they really, they let me experiment as a teacher and find what holds true for me. And that was really great. Lee, could you tell us more about your chamber music career? Yeah, I mean, uh, I've, it's here and there, right? Uh, it's not something, it's something that I really love, but it's not something I've done per, for professionally per se. Like that's, that's not exactly what I've done. Um, I was in a woodwind quartet, shout out to the Pulse Quartet at Oberlin. <laughs> Uh, we did like a couple of festivals, Carmel Music Festival, I think we were finalists for. We didn't really, you know, like we were learning as we go uh, and, you know, things like that. There was, this was before, you know, YouTube and you could hear what, you know, lots of what people are doing currently or what these festivals are like. Um, now you can just go online and Google various different music festivals. You're like, oh, that's what's going on there. <laughs> and so we, you know, we learned, you know, it was a great learning experience. I went through a lot of uh, quartet music, which is great. Um, and then I've played in a lot of quartets, very, many more quartets than quintets, which is very strange and unusual, but it's just how it works. So I know the quartet literature quite well at this point. Um, and then uh, when I got my job at the University of Missouri, I got to play with the Missouri Quintet, which was really special for me because I grew up listening to the CDs of their Maslanka recordings. Like, this is the group that I listened, you know, like, because back then, you know, it wasn't YouTube, it wasn't, you know, downloading from iTunes. This was, you get a CD, you had to invest in it. <laughs> it was not, it was not cheap. It took up space. I even had tapes, but the CD, one of the first CDs I had was the Missouri Quintet recordings of Maslanka's quintets. And like, all of a sudden I'm playing in that. I was like, this is amazing. I can't believe it. <laughs> you know, like it was really, really special. And man, did that really up my quintet game really fast. <laughs> I Like I never played so much quintet in so, such a little amount of time. I learned so much music. I It was neat because I remember getting music. I think we even, we did two different Maslanka quintets and I remember getting one. I'm like, I can't play this. <laughs> I can't imagine playing this in six months from now, let alone, you know, next week with you guys. <laughs> and so it really made me like, it pushed the limits of what I could do really well. So that's really neat. Um, I am currently in a duet right now. I, 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 since there, all my uh, chamber music is really 
me wanting to play with friends. <laughs> like it's totally self-indulgent and I'm just so excited. So I'm in a contra and bassoon duet with my dear friend, uh, Leah Uribe, who is the bassoon professor at University of Arkansas. And it was just uh, started out with a couple of pieces I had, uh, you know, from a friend or, you know, commissioned part of a commissioning consortium. And I was like, will you play this with me? And she said, yes, because she's amazing <laughs> like that, because no, Nobody would sign up to do a bassoon contra bassoon duet, you know, like it's such a crazy combination. And, uh, you know, we have, we're really excited to hopefully when the pandemic is over, we have a, a, a commission from Jenny Brandon called an orange tree, which is just stunning. It's like, I'm so excited to play. I, like, it's one of those things I can't wait till we can be in person again, because it's such an incredible work from Jenny Brandon. And I'm a big fan of her music, but this is like, this is my favorite thus far. So I can't wait for you guys to hear it. Um, so that's kind of what I've done with chamber music is mostly just play with friends. <laughs> mm. Lee, could you share more about your orchestra career? Yeah, my orchestra career, the most of it, I mean, now, of course, I freelanced a lot in Boston. I did that in Kansas City as well. Um, and I've, I've had a fine, I made the finals for a couple big jobs. Uh, and I've also won a couple of regional orchestra, you know, smaller, smaller orchestras. And I really love what I do. The, the thing that was most transforming for me, though, was being one of, on the sub list for the Kansas City Symphony. I was on there from... 2000, I think it was 2007 to 2018. <laughs> it was a long time. I was on the sub list there for them um, until I moved away for my job. And um, they, the symphony covers both the Kansas City Symphony, the ballet, as well as the lyric opera. So it's actually an all-encompassing job. And the musicians there are incredibly incredibly talented, <laughs> like I can't even tell you. And a lot of my jobs were with them would be, you know, last minute sub jobs or, you know, like it wasn't, you know, a lot of times. So I actually learned a lot as a bassoonist. My sight reading skills got a lot better, thankfully, because they, they were very patient in the beginning. I was not prepared. <laughs> <laughs> as to be the last minute sub person, you know, that wasn't something I'd ever really thought about. So I, it made me a much better musician and playing with a group that just is so good. <laughs> like, I, I mean, I can't tell you, like, they're so nice and they're so good. The bassoon, uh, the bassoon section is just fantastic, led by Ann Bilderback. Um, and like, it was neat because I had to you know, match my sound to theirs and figure out how to blend. And I played a lot of second bassoon. They actually didn't, I kind of kept it a secret. They didn't know I was a contra player until a couple of years into it. I was like a little tiny secret I held. <laughs> and so I played a lot of second bassoon and I fell in love with playing second bassoon. <laughs> it was like, I had so, I love the, like being the supporting role where, you know, you, you're a second bassoon if you play a low C as sort of like, you know, high in pitch at all, it ruins the whole woodwind section. And if you can play it in tune, you can hear the tone and the, the whole section relax. And just being able to do that and learn to do that well was incredibly rewarding. So that's where I fell in love with second bassoon. And now I'm in, oh, oh yeah, I should say, I'm now I'm in Symphony of Northwest Arkansas, where I play with Leah Uribe, and it's an it's a orchestra in Fayetteville, uh, uh, Arkansas, and I really love the group. It's just, you know, it's just such nice people, and it's just a fun group to go and hang out with. It's, you know, it's work, yeah, but it's also really fun, and I love that about that. <laughs> Do you have a favorite concert experience that you could share with us? Performing? Yeah, okay, so I saw this one and I had to think of a couple things because uh, again, like a lot of my, I, you know, I, I, I learned a lot as a sub for Kansas City and there would be things like, like my sight ring skills, obviously, like, in, like one time I think I got called to play the contrapart on Turando in a performance two hours before the concert started. I literally didn't have enough time to listen to the opera all the way through before having to go play it. And I love that kind of like roller coaster adrenaline ride. It was really, really fun. Um, it, you know, like, or, and then, but the one that really stood out for me, I was thinking back with Kansas City, was uh, the concert that we played with Ben Foldsfied. And he did a, I think he's still doing a series 
where he comes and plays his music or arranged for orchestra. And it was ridiculously fun. <laughs> like, I, I'm not, I, I honestly wasn't that familiar with his music. I'm not, a, I, I have a lot of friends who are Ben Foldfies fans, but I've never really gotten into it all that much. But he was such an advocate for the orchestra. Like, that was the coolest part of all of this. Um, at one point, he asked the audience members, who's the first time seeing the Kansas City Symphony? And something like 80% of the orchestra audience raised their hands. This was their first time seeing the orchestra. So he was bringing in a whole new audience and introducing them to what the orchestra sounded like in a way they probably have never heard before. And that was really cool. Like, and he just, you know, he does his improv thing where he'll make up a song, he'll write a song for you in every concert. And he did a new song each night. I didn't know it was coming. All of a sudden he's like, basses, play this line and he would sing it or play it on piano and then he was like violins now do this and all of a sudden we were playing a whole new piece that hadn't been played before <laughs> um and just that seeing that kind of spirit brought to an institution of an orchestra you know like not kansas city per se but just the orchestra institution is really kind of sometimes stuck in the mud and that was really neat to see it in a different light and what it can be done you know if you just had the energy to do it. And so that was really neat. <laughs> um, so that was really, really fun. To, it made me think about what we can do as orchestra musicians to reach community of music, of audience that we might not have reached before. Mm. Could you tell us about a memorable audition experience or competition? The most, like, honestly, none of them stick out one over the other, but I can just tell you, like, if like contrabassoon auditions are like family reunions <laughs> there is no time we ever get together i mean we have contraband sometimes at idrs and things like that but contra auditions especially the bigger ones i remember i was one i think it was montreal uh audition many many years ago and i just looking around the room and i'm like i'm in a room with my friends how cool <laughs> you know like we're all warming up and like you know, we got to, you know, caught to catch up, catch up. That's the only problem with being a contra player is there's only one of them in every orchestra. And so it's interesting to really like get to hang out and talk shop and, you know, just n not in a way distracting from the audition, but in a way just like, it's good to see you. <laughs> like, it's nice to actually see you in person. And so that's kind of like my best memories are from contra auditions and, and meeting and, and catching up with my friends. Mm -hmm. Lee, how do you cope with music performance anxiety and can you share any tips with us? Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure I'm the best person to ask this, but I will share you my personal experience and I can only say that represents my personal experience. Hmm. All of my performance anxiety that interfered, and let me say, that interfered with the final product of the performance, right? So there's always performance anxiety that doesn't go away. But hmm. the, the amount that interferes with the performance came out of the way that I was practicing, which was I wasn't practicing correctly. <laughs> it came out of practicing incorrectly. And hmm. I, it took me a very long time to discover it. This is one of the things that I've struggled with not in when I wasn't sure I could be good enough bassoonist because I was practicing a lot but I wasn't practicing the right way so or I wasn't practicing I was playing a lot <laughs> I should say now that I know what practicing is it's it totally wasn't the right way of doing things when I heard you need to play it slower I would slow it down like 10 or 15 clicks right you know that's what I would do I would play marriage to figure out at, you know, 120 rather than <laughs> 132 or 144 or even 152, you know, like I didn't realize that we actually have to stop take things so slow that we get rid of all the negative energy. And this includes fingerings being on going from one fingering to the next without being confident. Like that's something to get those insecurities. Um, that includes rhythmical issues when there's really complicated rhythmic. Also controlling your internal pulse as well, because like if you're not slow enough to pay attention to intonation, your fingers and everything, you can't get better. You, if you can't actually hear what you're doing wrong, you're always gonna feel insecure about it and this is like you have to play things in order to win an orchestra audition in order to play a really phenomenal recital you have to play things correctly for so long you forget what it feels like 
to mess up. <laughs> and that's really a lot. That's a lot different way of practicing. I would just practice it. I got it right. Yay. And then I would like, I'm going to get it right always from now on. Right. Isn't that how it works? Um, I didn't realize how long you had to play things at the level that you wanted them in order for that to show up in the final product consistently. Now, that's the thing, it's consistently. I have discovered that when I miss a high E after playing it right a thousand times, I just laugh it off at this point. I'm like, whatever, <laughs> you know, like that was one in a million versus the feeling I felt when I miss a high E when I'd only gotten it right once or twice prior to performing, right? You know, like that, that, that tenseness and it's like, oh, I missed it. Why did I miss it? Right. And now I have a total different outlook on bassoon because everything is about positivity rather than negativity. Like, you know, like the one time that I didn't play it right. Oh, you know, it's okay. <laughs> I wish I played it. I'm not, don't get me wrong, but you know, there's some things that are just out of your control, whether it be dryness in the hall, or the, the, you know, like water in your, your finger, your, your, your uh, tone holes, things like that. There's just some things that you can't control. And, you know, like I felt okay about it. Cause I was like, I played it right so many times. It, it couldn't be me. It's like the difference between a good read and a bad read, like a good read maker and a bad read maker, I should say, is the bad read maker spends a lot of time working on bad reads. <laughs> <laughs> and it feels terrible, I will say. Um, don't waste time on bad pieces of cane or reads that are just not going to be the good read. The faster you can learn to, to, to get rid of that read, get it out of your life, get that negativity out of your life, the better and happier you're going to be as a read maker because you're going to waste a lot less time. <laughs> so that's my experience. And it's personal to me. I tried a lot of different things. I did try beta blockers. They didn't help. <laughs> they, like There was nothing other than honest to goodness different approach to practicing. And once I figured that out, I realized I was nervous. But everything went right. <laughs> and I couldn't like because I couldn't imagine playing it wrong at that point. I had forgotten the feeling of playing something incorrectly. And it just took over. And that's when I started to make finals for some bigger jobs. And really my my career started to, you know, take off as a musician. So that was a big lesson for me. Mm -hmm. Lee, have you experienced any music related injuries? And could you share with us any tips to avoid that? Um, I haven't experienced any injuries per se, specifically from playing music. I have injuries. I think I told you I was a horseback rider. <laughs> I felt I, when I was young in order to ride horses, since, you know, I didn't always have the money to ride, you know, my own horse. I didn't have my own horse, but I found out a lot of stables had horses that they need trained and they just need someone to stay on as long as possible <laughs> and work with these horses and get them into shape for someone to ride them. Mm. So that was what I did a lot as a trainer. I was the one with the, the horses that were sort of, you know, rejects, if you will, or nobody else was willing to ride them. And so I fell off a good amount of times. And I, I'm pretty sure I have injured both my neck as well as my shoulder from that. And not in a way that's been debilitating. I can still function, mm. uh, you know, perfectly fine, but there is a lot of pain there, which can, because it's my right shoulder, can get exasperated mm. uh, by the bassoon or by reed making. Um, things that I have done, um, I love the ergo crutch. Um, let me see. I have my bassoon over mm. here. I don't think it's available anymore, but I think it, uh, there's a couple of different versions of it that are even better, but it's a crutch that if you see, I can move it up wow. and down. Uh -huh. And it's really phenomenal because what it does is it changes, you know, like if I had to do this, that even hurts, right? Lifting my shoulder up because that's where the injury is. And it takes it so my hand is down, but my wrist is still straight because uh -huh. if I didn't, if I didn't have it, my wrist would have to bend to keep my shoulder low. Yeah. And that really helped me. The other thing I use is a strap for a contrabassoon that Chris uh, Wayatt sells uh, that's phenomenal. And it's kind of, it, he makes one for contrabassoon. He also makes one for bassoon. And for bassoon, it attaches onto your neck strap ring. And on contra, I even now on my newest contra, I have a neck strap ring put where it's most in balance, but you can also hook it on, the, a lot of people hook it on the brace between the joints. And that, like, honestly, I can take both hands off the contra and it stays in place, which is really exciting. Yeah, because if you can, a lot of people fix that problem by doing it straight up, but what that does is bring my arm very far forward again, 
over time, I found, especially when I was doing like six hours of contra playing in Boston, like well, some days I would be on, on the, in the chair between school and gigs and my, my arm would be so much forward that I would start to get that pain in, you know, from that injury. And, um, so that releases the tension because I can then lean the contra just a little. I, it leans against my left leg and that holds the contra up so it's not being balanced in my left hand. And so it just makes it, you know, I call it hands-free contra. <laughs> <laughs> Lee, could you tell us about your reed making style and any techniques that come to mind? My reed making style, I like to call it the good old American reed. <laughs> I don't, I don't, you know, like it's, it's there, you know, we have bigger reeds, which are normally associated with the European style. They're longer mm -hmm. reeds, which are 56 millimeters and longer. And then we have the shorter reeds that are often associated with Philadelphia style scrape or Garfield mm -hmm. scrape is known, which are 53 millimeters and shorter. And mine is 55 millimeters long. I use a K1 shaper. Um, it's sort of a hybrid of all of my teachers. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I can't say it looks like any single one of my teacher's reads. Um, it has a lot of influence from the Van Hosen style, obviously, but I use a different shape. So that's the big thing is I still use the taper from spine to tip that I use with the Van Hosen shape, but I use either a Rieger 1A or a Hertzberg shape. And then um, I, so I also have a lot of influence from the shape from uh, from Eric Stomberg and that he he was the one who suggested the Rieger 1A and then the Hertzberg later on. And that's really depending on what bassoon I'm playing. My most current bassoon, that's the one that it fits the best. And then um, I also just have like my read evaluation style. Like it's just sort of developed through time <laughs> over making lots of reads. It incorporates a lot of what all of my teachers have said and along with some things uh, like I, I never get old from Mr. Caymans from saying uh, it, your read is a carrot. I don't know if you've ever heard that before because there's no two carrots that are the same. Um, <laughs> and, and so I have a lot of that, uh, th you know, th those thoughts that have sunk into my psyche over the years from Mr. Caymans as well. <laughs> hmm. Can you share with us any behind the scenes of running a bassoon and contra bassoon read making business? Um, a lot of people ask me how I make so many reads in a year because I can, like, even in a pandemic, I'm going to make over a thousand reads this year. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. But, um, you know, so it's it's very few contra reads this year, but a lot of bassoon reads. Um, so uh, the biggest behind the scenes is how I make so many. And that usually comes with efficiency, which is something I didn't have or even think about when I started my company. My company was evolved like many that I see these days. I love it this year. If nothing, the pandemic has given us entrepreneurs. Like it's like the year of bassoon entrepreneurs. I've seen so many read companies like really say, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go forward with this and create their own companies. And I'm in awe of all of them because they're all taking that leap. And I know, I remember how hard that was. Um, so for me, I started my company and it took me 45 minutes to an hour to make a read. And I was charging, I think, 15 bucks an hour. And it cost me about four to five bucks per read. So that wasn't a lot of money <laughs> when you when you know you don't that, that wasn't including all the time I had to spend, you know, packaging ship doing taxes, the website, all those things. So I had to figure out how to make a read faster. And the biggest thing that I've learned since starting this read company is efficiency, which I'm going to call not getting rid of quality because you don't want to affect the end product, but how to do something faster mm -hmm. without greatly affecting the end product. And so that's the biggest skill that I have, I bring to the table, I guess, as an owner of Go Bassoon Reads, is I can make a read of a certain quality because I figured out the steps that you can either shorten, you can make faster with different machines, Hmm. or um, the weeding out of cane, my process for weeding out of cane, all of those things so that I, when I, you know, cut the blank in my time on the read, it's fast. And it, it takes me, uh, if it's a really hard piece of cane, which I don't usually spend, it's like no more, and we're talking from splitting cane all the way to packing it up and going no more than 25 minutes mm -hmm. uh, a read now. And it's usually 15 to 20, that's where I like to keep it in order to make sure that I can keep my price in a range where I'm making a living wage because I think that's important. That's another thing that new business owners don't realize. <laughs> you have to actually 
in order, in order to enjoy it, you need to be actually making living wage from it. It's just one of those things because otherwise you start to resent the time that's taking you away from other things. And um, I was, I had no idea. I had no idea it was going to explode. Um, I put up a website back then, you know, websites with order forms for read makers didn't really exist unless you went to a big double read company like Forest or Midwest or something mm -hmm. like that. But individual read makers didn't have those. So I was really getting in at the right time. You know, I was doing social media when it, you could really be an influencer without having to spend money. There weren't a lot of people on social media talking about bassoon, let alone bassoon reads or contra reads. And I really had a lot of luck. I really thank uh, Meg Quigley, actually. The, my first exhibit at Meg Quigley, I, I was at Round Top. I can't remember the year. I think it was 2013, I want to, I can't remember, it was 2014, somewhere around then, and I remember, maybe it was 12, I, I it's so long ago, um, but I remember going to it, and people saw me as a business owner, they, they tried my reads, they liked them, I, they tried my contra reads, especially, because I sold a lot of bassoon reads, but I didn't sell a lot of contra reads until after that, mm. and I remember running out of cane, you know, a few months later, I go, wait a second, what just happened, I just ran out, I've never run out of cane, uh, you know, because I usually buy a year's worth at a time, and yes. I looked, I was like, I need contra cane, <laughs> and it was just sudden, it was, it was an explosion, and it was very lucky, and so those are, you know, just, so, Making a living wage, that's something that you need to do as a read maker, that's definitely, or as a musician, you need to actually respect the effort and work that you think of all the money you put into school, your instrument, your tools, and the craft that you can do. It's, it's, it's to be valued. And so that was one of the really big things that I, I learned through Gobasoon, that and efficiency for read making. Oh, and then all, we won't go into taxes. <laughs> I learned a lot about taxes. Uh -huh. <laughs> that was the other thing. <laughs> hmm. Lee, could you share any final skills that come to mind that are learned through music and apply to everyday life? Yeah, um, there's. I, this is something that I stress a lot to my students because mm -hmm. we, as music teachers, need to stress we're not just teaching them to play bassoon. We're not just teaching them music theory or music history. By playing bassoon, they have a lot of transferable skills that make them more than qualified for a range of work. And a lot of my students will say, well, I can't, I'm not qualified for that. I'm like, let me, let's break down the skills you need to do this job. I bet you, you already do them as a musician. And that's what a lot of people haven't understood is how to communicate that. You know, I have these skills as a musician, and that's how you can get a job. You can make the difference between getting a job and not getting a job. As a musician, I do this every day. For instance, you're self-sufficient. How many hours are musicians just go, you give me a task, I will go and do it. That's practicing, right? How many jobs require that? Like every job, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. nobody wants to be micromanaged or be a micromanager. You know, um, how about teamwork in order to chamber music, play with a pianist, play with anybody, play in an orchestra. We have to make compromises. We have to listen to other people and we have to go somewhere and meet in the middle all the time. We have to, we have teamwork skills that are tested like every single day. Like this is more than most students do because we're practicing our craft every day. We're applying it. That's why it's called applied studies in bassoon. We're applying all these, these things all the time. And then finally, problem solving. Because mm -hmm. again, what are you doing all day as a bassoonist? You're practicing. <laughs> and that's what is wrong. <laughs> I have to listen and figure it out. And then I have to figure out how to fix it. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. And then I have to keep going until I do. And if it doesn't work, I have to correct, course correct, and figure it out. Like, again, these skills are incredibly valuable in so many jobs. And you can get a job just by being able to explain it, what you do as a musician. Yes. And you don't, even if it's not a bassoon job, you can get a job that could help you get that bassoon job yes. just by showing I have these skills that I practice hours every day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if you just are able to communicate those skills that, 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 what you're able to do to someone, you're going to be top of the top in line for any job you want. It's just like, it's really something to do. So that's, that's, that's what, I mean, I could go on. I, I, I taught classes in these, so I could give you a whole semester's worth, but I don't want to do that uh, for the length of time of this interview. <laughs> 
Lee, is there any advice that you can share for musicians just starting out their music careers? Oh, good question. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think that this is, again, something that is a theme of what I end up telling, talking to a lot of people. Have a dream job. Don't be afraid of it. And I'm not just saying I want to play bassoon for money someday. I'm saying I want to be principal bassoon of this specific orchestra, or I want to be contra bassoon. Like mine, I will share it to you, you know, because I know it's scary. <laughs> Back in the day, mine was I want to be contra bassoonist of the Metropolitan Opera. And since then, my long-term plan has changed. But every skill that I got because I wanted to be the contra bassoonist of the Metropolitan Opera, every skill that I learned along the way, everything that I did to try and do that actually evolved into skills that I use in my job that is actually my dream job once I figured it out. And as my life changed is to teaching. I use those skills every day. And so never be scared to really have that you know, scared moment, like this is my dream. And don't worry if it's going, your dream job is going to change tomorrow. Like if it's you change your mind, that doesn't matter. You're, but a lot of people just say, I'm going to be a musician and do whatever, you know, something. <laughs> Try to be as specific as possible and work like the Dickens to get it. <laughs> like that's the, like, that's, that's what the best advice I could give you. Is there anyone that you would be interested to see interviewed next? So I couldn't decide on a single person. So I have two, one who I know and love, and I think her story needs to be shared as much as possible. And that is Leah Uribe, um, my best friend. And she, her story about bassoon and the effect that she is trying to make on the music world needs to be told far and wide. So I do that. And the other one is a person I barely know and I really want to know more about, and that's Kika Wright. And she's a bassoonist that I've only just had some interactions with uh, over online. And I really want to know as much about her as possible. <laughs> mm. I'd love to reach out to them, Lee. Thank you so much. Oh, please do. Yeah, I'm so grateful for this interview, Lee. It's wonderful to get a glimpse into your life and career as a professional musician. And thank you so much for all this great advice. Of course. Thank you for having me. For everyone tuning in, keep an eye out for new videos with great bassoon guests every Thursday at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. On the Let's Link project, every guest interviewed here is hosting a free online Zoom panel discussion the following Sunday, Central Standard Time, and you can register for Lee's session on the Music Link website. Please like, comment, and share any questions or feedback in the section below, and subscribe to this channel for new videos every week. Check out the Music Link Instagram and Facebook pages for more information too. Check out Lee's Facebook page, Blanca Palooza, and get in touch with her at gobassoon at gmail.com. The Music Link is a New Zealand-based online resource for people to share, learn, and connect. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see y'all in the next video.